And that leads us really nicely into our second presenter from today, which is Richard Fitzpatrick from Edinburgh, who's going to be talking about uh, his use of Minecraft in teaching. And I know Ian is ridiculously excited about this one. <laughs> well, there's lots of videos, so hopefully uh, everyone can just sit back and, and enjoy uh, as long as everything works. I've probably cursed it now, haven't I? But um, yes, yeah, so, so what I'm talking about today is uh, the work I've been doing um, on a virtual field work for zoology students here at the University of Edinburgh. And I was kind of commissioned to do this uh, by Press Thomas Little, who runs uh, Field Zoology Free course at Edinburgh in biological sciences. He's not here today, but uh, I've put him there in case someone has a, a pertinent question on zoology or the course design, which I won't be, I might not be able to answer. Um, so I was kind of commissioned a little bit to do this. So I've been spending a couple of years uh, playing around with the concept of using Minecraft in teaching at university level and how to bring in real data into Minecraft and how to uh, really make it quite immersive and interactive and and more than what you might even expect you could do with Minecraft. And uh, COVID has actually proven quite useful for me in showcasing this. Um, and I'll, what I'm going to show you today is a little bit of the work that we did during COVID and how we're intending to actually use this in the next, in actually a few days time. So I've really got to kind of get on with uh, ver doing version two of this. So um, just there we go. So Field Zoology Free uh, is a, a field trip course, uh, largely. So it's, it's oriented around uh, kind of the practical aspects of zoology and learning about the techniques and uh, tools around doing zoology in the field. And the course is a semester two course, and it would normally end with a one week field trip to Millpot, which is on the island of Great Cumbrae. They stay at the, uh, there's a field uh, study center there, and it's done during the Easter break. So they finish their their degree, um, not their degree, finish their year, and then they have this Easter break time where they go on the field trip. And the report that they write there is worth about 50% of the course grade. So it's quite a big chunk of what they're doing in this course. It's a 20 credit course as well. Um, so 2020, uh, it was cancelled, you know, a couple of weeks before hand due to COVID. So they were just given a set of data and they were optimistic for 2021. But Tom had seen what I'd been doing with Minecraft and thought, well, I should maybe plan a contingency and maybe something like uh, this might be worthwhile, you know, give it a shot, see what we could do. There may be something interesting there. Um, and I was quite grateful for the opportunity. Um, so Tom had a set of requirements kind of based around the course uh, description so, and the learning outcomes that the students uh, see. And that was around making sure that we emphasized the role of experimental design in solving scientific problems that they would have to develop a project and answer a specific quest set of questions using a combination of different uh, methods. So uh, during their field trip, normally they would do field work on the beaches of the island and they would work in the laboratory in the, in the field center as well uh, with caught specimens or um, depending on the project that they set up. Um, and then just to be aware of the context of field studies and to apply that. And I think Tom, Tom has told me he would have been happy with something relatively simple, relatively straightforward in Minecraft, maybe just something where you count animals in a space or something like that. But that's not how I kind of approach these things. I like to be quite ambitious. So my aims were to actually recreate as much of a fieldwork experience as possible. So in my head, I wanted to basically recreate the, I wanted to recreate the island, basically. I wanted to actually represent the island in Minecraft and actually do everything as they would have done in real life just so happens to be on a computer and that was my, my what I set out to do and I found with Minecraft if you start with the ambitious one you end up getting about 75 percent of the way there um, so I wanted to make sure that there was a kind of freedom of choice here that the students could do a range of different projects uh, to have minimal constraints around that um, and for it to be immersive but also user friendly so I was aware that Whilst Minecraft is quite popular, it's, I think it's like 160 million people users every month. So it's, it's a rather ridiculously popular game, even still, despite being 12 years old. Um, I was aware that a lot of people still wouldn't have played it or maybe don't play games at all. So I wanted to make sure that they could understand it, that the controls were relatively straightforward, that the space was intuitive. And then that applied for staff as well. So there was no point making something that was fantastic, but the staff couldn't navigate around it and help the students. So that was in my head as well. And I've always, in developing these things, uh, I think it was Thomas Malone had this kind of very early on in the 80s concept of what makes a good game, being curious. So an element of curiosity, an element of fantasy, and an element of challenge. So those were the kind of driving factors in my head when I've been building this uh, field trip experience. So as I said, uh, I wanted to recreate the actual island. Um, and 
I wasn't able to actually recreate the actual island itself because I couldn't get the right scaling, but there's a wonderful program called Earth Tiles, which is by uh, Matthias Brennecke. And it takes real world, real world data uh, via GIS. So it, that contains information and kind of the, the topology of a landscape or the kind of trees and the urban distribution and things like that. And you can set up a pipeline. He set up the pipeline uh, that you can convert that data into a Minecraft world file. So whilst I couldn't do Combray, I did actually use real world data and then just edited the island slightly to suit my own needs. Uh, there'd be bonus points if anyone can work out what island that was. Um, it's, it's maybe roughly the same size as Cyprus. I might be wrong there, but um, as, a, as a hint. But yeah, so I manipulated the space um, so that we would have this uh, giant field work uh, space, which we could work in and I can add to and develop over the course of, I think I had about six months to develop this. So uh, the main island consists of four uh, beaches and then a main central space called Millport in homage to the field trip that they would have uh, normally gone on. And uh, I won't go into the technicalities of the Minecraft element, uh, but I'm happy to talk about that with people if they want afterwards. Uh, and we also had a, a tutorial island as well to get people up to speed with this. And uh, I'd originally conceived of it as a single player experience, which uh, I think in hindsight wouldn't have worked at all. Um, and we were lucky that the IT department in biology here um, at Edinburgh actually liked Minecraft, which was positive, uh, and also helped to set up a server on the University of Edinburgh uh, infrastructure. And we just whitelisted the uh, students. So we all gave them a copy of Minecraft. It's about 18 pounds, so it's relatively cheap, much cheaper than the field trip. Um, and then we got them to give us their username. We added them to this server on a whitelist, so um, only they could access it. And it meant then we had complete control over who was in the space as well. And we opened the server for a total of five days. So it was very similar length to the actual field trip that they would have gone on. Um, and we were doing full days there as well. So it was kind of uh, lectures in the morning, uh, nine, 10 o'clock a day worth of data collection. And then we'd have uh, evening socials, which would take place partly in the game, partly not. Um, so uh, tutorial island. So I, as I say, I was conceiving this a little bit like a game and I wanted to make sure everyone was up to speed with how Minecraft works and the control system. So we gave them tutorial island a week before uh, the actual, we opened the server. So they could download this, uh, install it on their own, into their own Minecraft version. And there's a little video there. So they could play around with interacting with blocks, uh, read some controls, play around. And the island was designed like a tutorial. So there was a series of challenges that they would have to take part in. So this was one on counting rock pool sizes and they would have to input the right um, sizes for the different rock pools in order to pass the next zone. So they couldn't get to the next room without completing each task, no matter how much they would try. I, I deliberately made it incredibly difficult to cheat. So uh, they would have to go and finish this uh, in order to move to the next area. And at the end, there is a final task that they would have to submit. So that one there was actually measuring turtles using a carrot on a stick, which becomes very important in the rest of the uh, field trip. Um, and the museum here, it was about identifying uh, the organisms on the island as well. So this actually gave them a lot of a preview of what they were going to be experiencing on the island and in their projects, but also allowed them to get used to the controls, the space. They would be finding it very hard to destroy irrevocably and not be able to actually complete the tutorial. So it was a space where it was reasonably safe to kind of learn the tech, learn the uh, controls, learn what we were trying to get them to do. It's my rather ominous looking beach um, where they would have to, they had to draw a graph of this, of the different flora and fauna and see whether there was zonation at the different heights above sea level. So uh, we actually, this was quite successful. We didn't have anyone who got stuck. Some people got stuck with downloading the map. That was, I think, the hardest thing that actually happened there. So we were quite confident when we started that everyone would be up to speed uh, with the space and be able to kind of hit the ground running uh, with this. So uh, the actual game, as I say, the actual Millpot space itself is this kind of central hub zone. And I wanted to make it um, immersive, a little bit fun, uh, big I think it's kind of a sense of scale is quite useful for developing these types of things um so this millpot station would be the space where you would if you enter the server this is where you would start 
you can pick up your tools at the tool collection point um, and then you've got a choice you can either take a train journey to the beaches or you can teleport to the beaches depending on how immersive you want to put yourself in this how much kind of role play you perhaps wanted to do um, the train journeys are a little bit trippy they were my kind of procrastination from writing up my thesis so I kind of went a bit 2001 sometimes with some of the designs um, which was it was fun for me at least um, and Tom quite appreciated them I'm not how sure how much the students used the train journeys when they realized that they could last like 10 minutes um but uh yeah so there was an opportunity to kind of integrate and interact with the space um kind of in a kind of real life way or kind of with the advantages of being in a game type setting there's also homages to millport so if anyone has been to millport i recreated one of the pubs there and the ritz cafe which is famous for its rather 70s interior which is actually surprisingly easy to set up in minecraft um but yeah so i wanted to build millpot into a space that was it wasn't just about uh, what they were doing in the game so it wasn't just about the projects that they had to do and complete there were spaces there that had really no relevance to what they were going to be doing but they could explore them they could see what they were they might want to go and look up why i had built them in the first place just adding a kind of uh, a history to the space which i felt was quite important uh for the kind of success of this and how students responded to doing their field trip in this kind of virtual space. So moving on to the experiments, um, there's two main areas they could do the experiments. So as Tom's kind of description had told me, they did work in the field and work in the lab. So I have a lab space and I have the field space, the lab space uh, where you can see a bit of Millport as I get there as well. And a, a very friendly sheep. Um, so the lab space we set up as a kind of like a food preference almost type task. So there was a series of pools and arenas in this space, and you could select different uh, plants or sessile animals to put at the ends of these arenas. And once you'd selected those, you can uh, choose from up to three uh, captive species. So we wrote a field guide to this, a handbook written just as if you would write a handbook for being in the actual field normally and said, well, we've got these captured animals in this laboratory space. You can observe them. You can develop a project around perhaps the preference for different foodstuffs in the island. Uh, and you could compare between species or you might want to compare within a species and do multiple tests. So here, for example, we can use an ocelot. And if you can see, there's a little thing running around down there. And you would have a choice then. So you could either collect data on what they were visiting or like the sides of the arena, the time they took spent there, you could choose how long you wanted to run your experiment for. Uh, so some students ran these for hours and you would just watch, they just did an avatar just staring down on these observation decks. Um, but the choice was up to them. There's a freedom there to, to pick what they wanted. And this indeed proved popular. I had to build a whole other level to this laboratory uh, whilst we were doing the actual field trip because our, our booking system got overwhelmed. Um, but then there was the, the other thing, the most, more, maybe the more important thing was the work in the field. And this one was quite proud of in, in porting data into the game. So, uh, so I've got my handy turtle measurer. I'm checking out the maps of the beaches there, which are all featured in the, in the uh, station. Take, deciding not to take the train and teleporting to Clash Island Beach. So each beach has its own properties, its own geography, its own topology. Uh, there's crocodile rock there in the background. Uh, some are exposed beaches, some are sheltered beaches. All of them had turtles on. Uh, there's 970 turtles across all four beaches. And each turtle has its own set of data. So width, sex, and shell length. And those, that, the, those tools we picked up in the station allow us to tag those. And I put a bit of customized information for each of the items in the game, which would allow students to understand why we put them there. So we've got quadrat material to lay down quadrats. We've got a quadrat slayer if we want to destroy the quadrats. Um, we've got the carrot and a stick, which is our turtle measure, which allows us to collect data from those turtles, and then the tags. So the counter tag stops you from being able to collect data from that turtle. So if I try and collect data, it actually gives me the nearest available turtle instead. So this allowed people to avoid double counting. They could work in groups and make sure that they, were, they weren't double counting their errors as well accidentally. And then you could restore the turtles with their uncounted tags so that someone other group could come along and uh, measure them as well. So it was all quite nice set up and say there was a choice they could count all the turtles which i had to do so i did a, a turtle audit on this um or they could do it more scientifically and lay down transects lay down quadrats um but you know we gave them guidance but we didn't tell them what they had to do they had to come up with these ideas themselves um 
So uh, say students, I, I avoided being around them too much in the field because I didn't want to distract them from their work, but we did, I did get a few screenshots of some of them working uh, in the field here. So looking in the rock pools there, for example, which I didn't show you in the videos, and they have a range of different tropical fish and corals, and they're all of different sizes, depths, shapes, heights above sea level. Uh, some, even, some students even started looking at the composition of the rocks uh, around them, the material around them, which I'd not really considered, but um, some made for an interesting project for some of them as well. Um, so they really kind of, you can see that they're all working in the same space as well. So we had, I think, 60 students on, or on the program and we had five staff. So it's about maximum amount of people on any time 65 and it, the server ran fine. And you can see people had customized the avatars to kind of look like famous people or themselves. Um, and uh, everyone could work in that space. And this was fantastic um, to see them working like this and doing that throughout the kind of five days that we had. And here's some of the project examples. Uh, so the first day in the server, they actually went around and explored each of these projects, would then decide what they wanted to do and then be put into groups based on their choice. And then within those projects, there was a whole range of different things they could explore um, and, and adapt these projects to answer sp their specific questions or their specific hypotheses they had based on their first look at the space. And I can go into more detail into those um, after I've spoken in case people are interested in a little bit more detail in those. Um, but none of this I think would have worked. And, uh, and even when we're moving forward with this, uh, we're gonna keep this without using something like Discord. So Minecraft doesn't have a very good communication aspect to it. Um, you can either chat to everyone in the world or you can chat to one other person in the world. And if you're working in a group of about six, that's not going to work. So uh, we decided to develop a, a, a Minecraft Millpot server. And uh, if you've not used Discord before, it's it was kind of designed exactly for this, for people playing in groups and games to talk to one another in a range of different ways. So uh, it allows you to do text channels, audio channels, video channels. And we set it up so there was general channels, there was a channel for each group, um, and they had a text version and an audio version. And this really allowed uh, staff and students to communicate with one another in real time across those days um, and swap information and to do it in spaces that they felt comfortable. So the, the audio channels were pretty much always on and there was pretty much everyone from each group in there for, throughout the entire day. Um, and they could summon staff in if they wanted uh, or into the text channels and it was used constantly. So you can imagine they might be doing, uh, they might have their laptop on working on Minecraft, they would have their phone at their side with Discord on, talking to one another, sharing a bit of information in there, but whilst playing in the game. So you could kind of communicate with one another in this kind of seamless way. Um, and we found it, it worked fantastically well. It works way beyond what I was expecting actually. Uh, and we, indeed we even used it in the social events in the evening. We would set up a pub quiz where we would all be in the pub in Minecraft in our little function room. And then we would have the video channel up and Tom would give us a pub quiz and we would have, and we would do it in there. And then we had a whole pub quiz ceremony at the end as well. I built a whole room for it. Um, I think, I think I went a little bit overboard uh, with this in the end, but I, I put up some screenshots here of some of the examples of how we use Discord. Um, uh, so we had a room booking system. We had students talking about their projects, about where, what factors they think they should try and graph for their projects, what data they should do. We had students sharing graphs, sharing uh, R scripts to make uh, plots, um, communicating with staff, arranging meetings with staff, uh, sending pictures to one another. It was really a well-used resource and really helped, I think, bring the whole experience alive and make it as close to that, what I intended it to be. So to be the field trip just on, in Minecraft, basically. Um, and I thought I'd just show a picture. Of, we had a, we tried a few group screenshots. It was difficult to get everyone in the same place at the same time. So you can see some of the groups here. Um, I say you've got personalized avatars here and I've, I've named the staff there, um, but yeah. Um, so we, we, we had a lot of fun. It was, it was, a, it was a kind of great uh, experience and everyone did really enjoy uh, taking part in this. And I think this was reflected in the feedback that we got. So it was a very, very relatively rudimentary feedback, but um, almost all the feedback related to the actual Minecraft experience was positive, which was quite reassuring for me. Um, and a lot of the things I was happy to see was about it being quite easy and accessible to people who'd maybe never played Minecraft that it felt like a real group fieldwork experience, that 
it substituted for that. It wasn't a full, you know, it wasn't people saying, oh yeah, this could replace it entirely, but that it really did capture what they were expecting or anticipating if they were going to go in the field. And uh, the quote on the bottom right there was fantastic for me because I'd built this with the intention for perhaps using it long-term. Um, and the, this person saying that it's a valuable tool perhaps to use as a dry run of methods and thinking about stats was what I did hopes for this to be as a kind of pre-field trip experience. Um, so it's really nice to see students saying that it matched quite nicely with feedback in previous years on this course, where students had said the biggest thing they wanted changed in the course was um, being able to do something prior to the field trip to Millport, which would get them used to collecting data and thinking about methods and statistics and data uh, exploration so they could really kind of hit the ground running with it and really uh, take ownership of that final report. So we're hoping moving this forward that actually this will kind of fill that gap because before there wasn't any time in the timetable, so to speak, to kind of do that and still meet all the course uh, content outcomes. So, and I'll explain how we're going to planning on doing that in the next month or so in a minute. Um, so yeah, so repurposing, as I say, thankfully, and maybe rather smugly for me, not much I have to change, which is great. Um, the main things has been about automating this space. So the intention is that this will now run in the background as something optional to do um, for a month and a half. So it's going to start the start of February and it's going to run all the way through to about mid-March. And during that time, the server will be open to all the students on the course and um, it's kind of going to set, be automated. So I don't have to be in the space or the staff don't have to be in the space necessarily. So um, the main things for me to be there is in case something goes catastrophically wrong, someone destroys something by accident that they shouldn't do, um, that I've not controlled for, um, or even gets lost on the island because the island is massive. Um, so what we're planning on doing is setting the server up so that it resets every day. So uh, I did, I was tempted to put some kind of like Majora's, is it Majora's mask, kind of moon slowly getting bigger as the cost of the day went on, but I couldn't work out how to code it in. Um, but the idea is to, to make it so that it's a space that can interact with projects and come up with projects um, based on what we'd done during COVID uh, last year. Um, and then write a summative, not summative, sorry, a formative report that would cover methods and data. So this would be an optional thing. They can do this before going on the field trip and hopefully for those that do want to take part in it to kind of pick up that experience in these dry runs and, and picking up that feedback so that when they do the final report, they feel a bit more confident. We're adding two extra projects this year. So one is a weather station. So we're gonna have a weather station on each uh, beach and there's a QR code in each one of those. You scan the QR code, it will take you to a data set. Um, which will have for each day that this server is running, there will be data for each one of those days for each beach. And it's going to be quite comprehensive. Uh, Tom's generating that out of the game. Um, and so what they have to do then is work out what data they want to use. Are they just going to do a project on weather? Are they going to tie it to one of the existing projects? How much they're going to use? And it's kind of their decisions and manipulating these kind of bigger data sets than the data sets that we've got in the game necessarily in the minute. And the second one is a trap cam. So each beach again is gonna have a trap cam space and the, I'm intending it to be that they'll scan a QR code and it'll give them a random set of images based off the trap cam of that beach every time they scan it. So as long as they only scan it once a day, they'll get a different set of data and it'll give them a, an interpretation of what's gonna be ocelot predation on turtles on the beaches. So the idea is the ocelots live in the jungle around the beaches and they come out at certain times um, of the day maybe or depending on the weather um, and pick up turtles so we're going to see if we can capture those on the trap cams what times do you see them with food or not how many did they see there's projects around that uh, and I'm going to keep an ear out on student feedback across the month so if things what they want to add or they feel something's missing I'm going to hopefully kind of adapt to that and kind of work in real time uh, in the server to build things up um, and add that to the experience based on what we're getting, what the information we're getting from the students across that time. So, so yeah, so there's not much I have to, to, to make this uh, move past COVID, thankfully. I, I can build a lot of this in to start with, um, which has made my job much easier this year. Um, so yeah, so I think that's everything I kind of want to cover with this at the minute um, and see what questions people have. Um, if people want to see more, see more videos, find out more about all of this stuff, um, that QR code you can scan to the website, my website, Neuron Safari, or you can add me on Twitter or send me an email. 
much of the work I did prior to this is in biomedical science and neuroscience and building experiments in there and making DNA factories and all sorts of other crazy things. So um, also happy to talk about other potential uses of this as well. Um, but thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Richard. That was absolutely awesome. Um, probably one of the most entertaining tools we've had in terms of sort of turtle counting and the, the turtles certainly <laughs> been very, very popular. <laughs> We had a question from Nicholas. Uh, he said, uh, how did you deal with the hardware requirements for Minecraft? So did some students struggle with having computers that couldn't cope with the graphics, things like that? Yeah, so it was it was a potential worry. I think luckily I have quite an old computer that I was testing this on to make sure things would run. Um, and it was a potential issue. Uh, thank a lot of the issues with um, the kind of strength of the server and uh, strength of com people's computers is a bit mitigated by running on the server so it takes some of the workload off their personal computers so we found that most people did find it was okay um no one no one's uh, device was unable to run it we found most all devices were able to run it and there was some quite old i did get one bit of feedback saying that my computer sounds like a wheezing uh, old car right now and uh, because it does make the fans go on to maximum uh, often it's because we use java edition and it's a memory hog and computers do not necessarily like it but we found that for at least that cohort this was fine that the devices were okay people were able to do it um and we didn't get any reports of it not being able to run thankfully um as i say I was, my computer's nine years old um so i was hoping that that would be nice and comparable that people's you know perhaps wouldn't have anything older than that um but yeah so it's been okay so far uh, we'll see what happens this year about it uh, is it um can it run on all different types of computers so chromebooks max pc doesn't matter what the student comes in with chromebooks it's now possible um i think it might be a bit tricky but uh, that was the one thing that we wouldn't it wouldn't have been able to run on last year when we did it someone's found a way of done a workaround but yes the version java edition we used can work on max can work on pc can work on linux um so it's quite versatile so it does open up a range of operating systems and and device choices right uh Noel's obviously a, a minecraft fan because he goes there's some nice mods installed on richard's installation by the looks of it so if you want to talk about what some of those are for, for oh. the fans yeah, so the, the videos are kind of prettified. So yeah, so we use a, a modification to make Minecraft look prettier than it perhaps actually is. Ironically, that makes it run smoother. So I found actually the frame rate and my run speed on my old computer it runs better with that prettier look. So that's why I tend to use it in the videos as well. Um, but the actual mods for students, they didn't, we didn't have any really. Um, the only thing we gave them was a, a modification that gave them the coordinates on the screen. So you might have seen some of the screenshots of his little a mini map in the top right corner that's not something that's normally there in minecraft but we wanted that because it gave them the coordinate details so if they were build if they were doing a project and wanted to define the space they'd measured or define the size of the beach that they were looking at then they would have the coordinate map there and that gave them um uh, those that material without having to extract it from the game in a slightly different way it just made it easier but I tried to avoid mods because that's installation steps and things for students and server incompatibilities. So where possible, pretty much everything you saw was designed in the, in the base game, in the vanilla version. Wow, it's amazing. Uh, Chris has uh, got a comment rather than the question. He said, I don't know if you know Helen Carney at Teesside, but she pre-COVID was using a mine, uh, Minecraft exercise as a warm up for real field, field work. So uh, it oh, was in for, for her website so that's you. great yeah no I, I will check that out um definitely yeah um I'm trying, actually maybe uh, maybe something i did see uh, around the time when i was looking into this see if anyone had done anything yes if, if helen's the one that does this in education edition of minecraft i do know helen uh, i'm not chatting to her directly yet but i did see her work it was an inspiration a jumping off point um so it gets to technicalities there so uh, helen uses a different version of minecraft and each version of Minecraft is its own different strengths and weaknesses. Um, so uh, we, I did it in Java because I wanted to put data into turtles, basically. So that's that's the main reason why I did it in that. But the education edition is, as the name suggests, sometimes it geared up a bit better for working in large groups. Yeah. Lots of comments about sort of awesome ideas and approaches, amazing work. Um, Ian's asked, what was the academic staff experience of using a game for teaching in higher education? Yeah, so um, 
so say Tom was my liaison throughout designing and building it, but there was four, four or five other members of staff on the course. And uh, I didn't really know too much before we even started. Tom was reassuring me, it's like, it's fine. They, they all get it um, and everything. And it was surprising how on boards they were. And I think it really helped with the students, um, their enthusiasm of the staff with it, because they got to see it as a preview, their comments, they're trying it out. Um, some of them, are, one of them in particular, you know, not very computer literate um, in terms of playing games or engaging with software like this. And he really fell into it quite nicely. You know, he could put his custom avatar up on, on his character and fly around the world and, and communicate with people, play around with uh, summoning his dog into the game and giving it his own custom name tag. So I think there was a certain uh, enthusiasm and like joy of it, they could spend time doing this. Um, and the, the staff experience was really positive. Um, all of them did say how much they enjoyed it but also they still met all of those learning outcomes. It wasn't, you know, diluting any of those at any point. They were seeing students get exactly what they wanted them to get out of it. So um, I think it's, if building something like this, having that in mind at the start really helps. Um, and perhaps I was always mindful of it and making sure staff were always going to be part of that experience. Um, it wasn't just building it towards students. Um, but yeah, it was overwhelmingly positive, really, really was. It sounds very dangerous to me. I think you'd spend an awful lot of time on this, and, you know. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, right. Yeah, if you're going to do this, the build time is long. I mean, this took me at least, I would, I would estimate, I didn't count it up, but probably at least like 300 hours of time, just conceiving of it, coming up with ideas, failing at things, waiting seven hours for the island to render through the pipeline, and it's completely seizing up my computer in the process. Um, so there's a lot of time, but once you've built it and once you've picked up those skills, there's it's really quick to adapt. It's really quick to add to change, as we're seeing now for this this year. I really don't have to change much. Um, and I'm doing all this. I should say as well, like I started with Minecraft in 2019, so I had the idea of using it, but I'd never played it before. I'd seen it. It'd all been through, you know, my undergrads and things, seeing it there, but never played it. And but it was so quick to pick up. I found and working with students as well. I've, I learned so much from students um, in the process of doing this. And, and um, that, that's been quite a useful way of learning about it as well. You know, they've always got some tips and tricks for you um, and pass those on to you, which is great. Do you anticipate getting the students to help build you new bits in the future? Yeah, yeah hopefully. Yeah, I think um, with this idea, yeah, it would be great to set up a project. I've got some... I've, I set up some kind of master's projects and honors projects here in biology with using it for outreach. I found it easier to pitch those projects. Um, but yeah, I'm really hoping to have for the next year, um, have something where we have them where they could build and, and add to this uh, field trip experience. Yeah, and and build it with what they would want in it as well and their intentions around what, how they learn in these spaces. Yeah, and learn from them in the process. That'd be, yeah, brilliant. Uh, one of the questions we have is about obviously the, the use of the pre uh, field trip uh, resource now. So it'd be really interesting to know what the student perception of that is after it's run this year. So if you maybe get back in touch with us after that's happened and let us know. That'd be Definitely. Great. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm really looking forward to seeing. Yeah. Um, and seeing how much, yeah, that feedback comes back on their final report and their, um, their if it improves their grades, I suppose, as well. I mean, as, like anecdotally, yeah. So the, re the reports they wrote for this field trip um, in 2021, the, the, the values, the grades were no different to pre-COVID. Or, or, um, so, so they saw that there was no kind of, it didn't improve their scores, but also it wasn't kind of catastrophic. You know, everyone still had the same uh, out quantifiable output, but I think the quality of the, the feedback we got was, was very positive on it. Um, so I think the quality of it was, was quite high in, in the students' minds.